Good singing, Piglet. Hello and welcome to another episode of Music Basics with Ballard. I am your host, Douglas Ballard, and I am so much looking forward to going on this musical journey with you. Today we are going to do an episode on basics for singers. We're going to talk about the four major voice parts, and we're also going to hear from a piano player. So our singers today on soprano is Donata Cucinata. We have Megan Williams and an alto. We have Ryan Golden, tenor, myself on bass, and Susan Geyer on piano. I'm very much looking forward to hearing from them, so let's get on with it. Just a quick reminder that this is distance learning for my students, so they have to find passwords that I'm going to hide in the episode and then put them into a quiz later, so thanks a lot for your understanding with that. <laughs> oh wait, I almost forgot. Any good singer needs to start with a warm-up, so let's do one. We're going to do E. done. Here's another one. It goes like this. Your turn. job. Now let's hear from our singers. Victor, do you want to be petted? Is that what you want? Okay, no problem. There you go. Before we start, my uh, cat Victor here wants me to let you know that there are four voice parts and they are described as such. We have soprano, they sing the highest notes, and then you have alto and they sing a little bit lower than soprano but they can usually sing pretty high too. Then once we get into the male voice parts we have tenor and they sing the higher notes for the male voices and then followed by the bass and the bass sings the low notes for the male voices. So here's the thing there are all kinds of other voice parts in there too. Um, we're just gonna focus on the basics ones for today but Victor wanted to make sure that you knew all about them. All right, so again, we have soprano at the highest, alto, just a little bit lower than the soprano, tenor, singing the highest male voices, and bass, singing the lowest in the male voices. Okay, so thanks again, and here we go. 
Our first singer today is our soprano, and that is Donata Cucinata. And she is a versatile American soprano and has been recognized for her powerful performances in operas, musical, and on the concert stage. Recent career highlights include Michael Tilson Thomas with the Louisville Orchestra, a Lincoln Center debut with the Queen's Symphony Orchestra, and multiple performances with Jack Everly and the Indianapolis Pops, where Tom Alvarez of the Indie Star noted her jaw-dropping solo during Oh Holy Night. Her performance was one of the most breathtaking he had has ever seen on any stage, anywhere, anytime. Last season, she returned to the Indianapolis Symphony Orchestra as a featured soloist in their From Vienna to Broadway concert and Yuletide celebration, in addition to singing Candice in the world premiere of Stay by John Glover and Kelly Rourke with on-site opera. This season, she looks forward to Countess Alma Viva in La Noza de Figaro with Opera Ithaca. Josephine in HMS Pinafore with the Knoxville Opera, and returning to Indianapolis Opera as Donna Elvira in Don Giovanni. Donata is also highly active on social media, and you can find her at Soprano Donata at Instagram and Facebook, and you can also find her YouTube channel, which I'll link down in the doobly-doo. But without any further ado, here is Donata talking about singing soprano. Hi, I'm Soprano Donata Cucinata. I'm a professional soprano. And I have sung opera, musical theater, and crossover all across the United States, um, most particularly in Indianapolis, where I'm based. I decided to get into singing because I love singing. It was the best thing ever. And I wanted to know more about how to train the voice. So this is meant for if you're interested in singing and starting off and you think you might be a soprano. Now, you might have heard about two different voice registrations. There's chest voice, where you talk. And there's head voice. So when you're riding a roller coaster and you go, wee, that's your head voice. Now, most men, when they sing, they sing in predominantly chest voice. So they use a different mix. When sopranos sing, we use mostly head voice with a teeny tiny bit of chest. So I believe that singing is speech plus support and space. And if you're going to train a soprano voice, one of the things that's really important to focus on is releasing that head voice into that space. I like to think of it as like a Thomas the Train Engine sound, like a just all of that nasal pharynx, all of that front part of your face. And what's interesting to me, especially training sopranos, is if singing is speech plus support in space, most people don't really speak where their natural speaking voice is, especially young women. It's not cool to have a high-pitched speaking voice. So when I'm training young singers, we do a lot of work trying to find where their natural speaking voice is. My speaking voice happens to be on the lower side, but I have found my way to finding the right speaking pitch for my voice so that when I'm speaking, I'm always using support and I'm always well-placed because I'm always wanting to practice proper technique if singing is speech. So if you're interested in training a soprano voice, any silly, ridiculous sound you can make to access that head voice place is helpful. It's also really embarrassing to do. So I like to recommend when I was first starting, I did most of my practicing in the shower. It's a very safe place to sing, especially when you're making funny sounds like Woo! At a rock band, or on a wee on a roller coaster, or actually, my favorite exercise is pretending I'm a spooky cow, and I put my hands on my face and I make the longest, tallest, spookiest ghost cow moo ever, and I go moo. Anything I can do to find that through head voice, and then mix it with just a little bit of connection to the chest. And the other thing I have to mention about training a soprano voice is that there are a lot more of us, which is interesting because when you're in high school or just starting out, you might think, oh, I don't have any high notes. You do, you're just not using any head voice. You're using all chest voice and dragging it up and that's why you feel like, oh, I can't get my any high notes at all because you're just going up the scale like this. Ah, and of course you're gonna crack. But if you mix your registers and make any kind of woo sound, you'll start to practice and find that space. The other thing that I think is really important for training a soprano voice is regulating breath pressure. And that goes across voice types. Most beginners 
when they go to sing a high note, they blow a lot of air at that high note. Now, I want a unified register, high note, low note, same amount of breath pressure, same amount of skinny, fast moving air. And so I like to do a lot of breathing exercises that practice it. It's almost like I'm starving the air. So I'll breathe in like I have a straw in my mouth and a smile on my face and I'll go, wait. And see how long I can keep that skinny, fast moving air flowing. Because if singing is just three things, speech, support, skinny, fast moving air, and speech, if I work on these things to find my head voice, all these silly sounds, and I work on regulating my air pressure so that when I sing a low note, ah, uh, and a high note, ah, uh, it's the same amount of breath pressure. If they're equal, then I can sing any note within my register. I hope this is helpful. And if you have any other questions about singing, I'll be posting more on my Instagram, Soprano Donata. Thanks for listening.
doesn't she have the most amazing voice? Yeah, it, it really doesn't get much better than that in the soprano world. So thanks a lot for singing for us, Donata. This brings me to my first word of the day, and that is hall, as in I want to deck the hall for Christmas, okay? So hall. The next singer we have is our alto, and our alto's name is Megan Williams. And Megan Williams is a classically trained vocalist whose career has taken her around the world. She's performed in many operas and oratorial works, but has also done some crossover into both musical theater and rock. She played violin and was a vocalist on tour as a member of the Wizards of Winter, along with the Trans-Siberian Orchestra, and was a performer for the Walt Disney Company on their cruise line in the parks and with the Voices of Liberty. Megan teaches private lessons in voice, violin, and piano, and is currently touring her solo show, I Feel the Spirit Moving. Let's hear what Megan has to say about singing alto. Hi everyone, my name is Megan Williams, and I'm here to talk to you about the best voice types in the world, mezzo-sopranos and altos. We mezzos and altos live stuck between the soprano and tenor divas. We are the part in a chorus that you can't necessarily pick out, but boy, do you miss it if it's not there. Smart, alluring, powerful, and strong. We are a little bit more down to earth types and the real musicians in any group. So the big question, how do you get to become one of these awesome ladies? Well, it all usually starts in a chorus somewhere where a director makes you sing a scale or two and then says, hey, you're going to sing alto. So you do, but there's a lot more to it than that. Uh, many times, young women are misplaced as altos simply because they can sing harmony parts. But this ability does not make you an alto. What does determine your voice type, soprano, mezzo, or alto, is your most comfortable vocal range and the color of your voice, its actual tone quality. Um, okay, so what does that mean? Uh, vocal range means where your voice is happiest singing for the longest amount of time. If you find yourself happiest somewhere between the F below middle C to the F two octaves above middle C, F3 to F5, then you're most likely an alto. If you're happy a little bit higher from the A below middle C to A two octaves above middle C, A3 to A5, then welcome to the mezzo club. You're all in very good company. Now, that does not mean that those are the only notes you can sing. You can probably sing lower. You can probably sing higher too, and you should. You may have a high C just like sopranos do. However, when a soprano sings a high C, they should be able to sing it with a bit more flexibility. Um, they should be able to do it loud, soft, and taper away. Mezzo singing a high C usually need more of a full voice to hold it and sustain it. We can go up to the notes, but we don't like to live up there. Uh, sometimes mezzos get called lazy sopranos. But um, like I said, it doesn't mean you don't have the notes. It just means we don't like to, to live up and sing in those, in those high parts all the time. We spend more of the time singing in the middle of our vocal range. So ladies out there who are altos, especially mezzos, you wanna work that passaggio register a lot. That C to E, C5 to E5, the C above middle C to that E. There's also vocal color that factors in. This is the actual tone quality of your voice, how it sounds. People usually say mezzo-sopranos have a richer, darker, rounder sound, while sopranos are more um, silvery and brighter. True altos are the darkest and richest women's voices of all. Keep in mind that if you are a young singer, your voice will continue to grow and develop and change over time. Women's voices don't fully mature until they are in their mid-30s or so, so you have plenty of time to grow into your sound and figure out what you really, really are. In classical music, like opera and oratorio, there are categories of voices called fachs. Contraltos are the lowest and rarest fach for women. Then there are three different kinds of mezzo-sopranos. Um, I should say mezzo-soprano literally means half-soprano in Italian. It's like in the middle. <laughs> Colored tour mezzos are best at singing long lines of very fast notes. Dramatic mezzos have the bigger voices, lots of sound and projection to play characters like Carmen and Aida. Lyric mezzos, which is what I am, are the most common because they are the broadest category. They usually have lighter, higher voices with a wider range um, and different vocal colors. 
In opera, they sometimes cross over into some soprano roles too. Many lyric mezzos play what are called pants or trouser roles, where you actually play the part of a young man or a boy. For those of you interested in musical theater, voice types, um, they are not as rigid and they vary widely between shows and musical styles. What matters more is the style you sing and your physical type. Um, right now, there are four main music theater styles out there. Legit, traditional, contemporary, and pop rock. Legit means more of a classically trained vocal style. Think Sound of Music, The Light in the Piazza. Traditional music theater is for belters, cabaret, Chicago, that kind of stuff. Next is contemporary music theater, which combines the belt singing with some pop and rock influences, shows like Wicked, Thoroughly Modern Millie, um, anything written by Jason Robert Brown, The Last Five Years, Parade, uh, Songs for a New World. Uh, and lastly, there's pop rock, which sounds more like pop and rock music. Yeah. Um, these show shows like Rent, Hamilton, and Dear Evan Hansom, which could kind of cross over into contemporary too. But... So when you think about your voice, which style is it best suited for? Um, you also want to think about your physical type, which matters more for music theater. It matters for opera too, but more for that. And all that means is, do you realistic, realistically blah blah, look like someone who could play a specific role? Um, also, ch personal choice. Do you find yourself more drawn to be the leading lady or to take on more of a character role? Do you prefer comedy? or drama. There's so many choices out there. In middle school and high school, that doesn't matter so much. Type, you can play anything. Go sing and act and dance your heart out. Have a blast. If you decide to audition for music theater for colleges, that's when it will start to matter more. Um, oh, and if you're at all considering music theater as a career choice, start taking every dance class you possibly can. It is so important. One big caution for all you music theater lovers, be careful of the belt. I'm not saying don't do it. It's exciting to hear. However, belting puts a lot of strain on the voice. And if done incorrectly, it can cause vocal damage, especially in young singers. So you want to be really, really careful of how you're belting. Um, and for everyone, oh, be careful if you're sick. As a singer, your body is your instrument. So take care of it. Don't sing on a sore throat, a tickle or a cough, and always drink plenty of water. It takes about 45 minutes from the time you drink water for it to get to your vocal cords. So drink up, even more when you're sick. But whenever you're going to sing, be sure to stay hydrated. Everything you put in your body goes right past your vocal cords, good or bad. So be smart, make good choices. Whether you're thinking about pursuing singing as a career or you just sing because you love to and it's fun, there are three techniques I teach all my students that you need to do before you ever make a sound. First is knowing how to breathe. Breathing low, breathing deep, breathing wide from your diaphragm. Try to breathe in every time without moving your shoulders up and down. And I'm sure you've heard some of this before and there's good reason for that. Second, Lift your palate. That's the space inside your mouth, that roof of your mouth. And um, you want to feel like there's an egg in there all the time. There's so much space inside your mouth. But your, your tongue and your jaw should be relaxed. So that you want to leave. So you get this kind of, you see the singer face that's surprised like. So every time you breathe in, you create this inside lift. And just, just total relax in the front. The third thing is support. You want to support your singing with your abdominal muscles. So you're not singing just from here on your vocal cords. That's a tiny sound from here, but rather using your whole body moving down, supporting with all of those muscles. That last one takes years to get right. And I still don't get it right after all this time. You think I would eventually, but no. Which brings me to my biggest piece of advice. Find a great teacher. I have been performing professionally for almost 20 years, and I've been teaching private lessons for 14 years. I still take lessons from my teacher too. Many people think that everyone can sing, that it just magically happens, but there's so much more to it than that. A great teacher will help guide you to find your voice. 
Um, they'll give you a solid technique to keep your voice healthy now and into the future. And you can find a teacher um, who specializes in any style you want to pursue. Don't feel like if you're going to look for a teacher, you just go for classical. There are ones who are classical, more musical theater, or even if you're an aspiring pop or country singer or songwriter. Um, but a teacher, a good teacher can make all the difference. Well, thank you so much for listening to this today. I hope it helps a few of you aspiring mezzos and altos to better figure out and um, understand your own voice. Take good care of it. Try not to compare it to this person's or that person's. You are your own unique instrument. And that is something so special. So join the chorus. Audition for a musical. What the heck? Write your own songs. Sing everything and anything you can. Just enjoy making music. Sing with joy from your heart and light up the world with song. I wish you all the best. So break a leg. Bye. Hey, Megan, thanks a lot. That was really, really awesome. Again, beautiful singers. They know what they're talking about. Go ahead and pay attention to their voices, okay? Hey, before we move on to my next singer, I just gotta say, they just decided that they have to do road construction right near my house, and I've been trying to wait them out, but I can't anymore, so just bear with me. You're gonna hear construction noises. I apologize. Now back to basics. All right, our next singer is Ryan Golden, and Ryan Golden is our tenor. Ryan Golden is an active performer in Philadelphia and the surrounding suburbs. His areas of focus have been gradually shifting to stage direction and music direction over the past few years. He has been principal tenor with the Rose Valley Chorus and Orchestra and Old Town Carolers, and has also performed professionally with the Players Club in Swarthmore, Pennsylvania. He enjoys empowering young singers and performers to reach their optimal potential. So we couldn't have asked for a better guy. Take it away, Ryan. Hi there, my name is Ryan, I'm a tenor, and Mr. Ballard asked me to put together some tips that I had for young tenors. So here we go. First tip, training a tenor voice is very tricky. It's a difficult instrument. We're not gonna get into the physical, scientific reasons why that is the case, but the point that I'm trying to make is that my very, very, very first recommendation for you is that you need to find a teacher. 
you need to find a private instructor. And specifically, you need to find a private instructor that works for you. Because that's my second tip. You are your instrument. So as you continue on your musical journey, you need to figure out what works and what doesn't work for you. What vocalizations help you get into a place where you're ready to sing? What types of things like drinking tea with honey or drinking water with lemon or whatever really kind of puts you in that place that makes you feel prepared to get out there on that stage and perform. And that also speaks for your teacher. Trust your teacher, have faith, but if that relationship isn't working, find another teacher. There are plenty of teachers out there because ultimately you need to know what works for you. So number three, again, you are your instrument. You need to care for your instrument. You need to practice self-care. It's true for pretty much everything, <laughs> but especially for singing, you need to be well rested. You need to be hydrated. You need to stay healthy because you are your instrument. You only get one. You can't buy another one. So you gotta take care of it. Number four, again, without getting into the psychology of it, singing is very scary. It can be very exposing for a lot of people. And partly that is because you are your instrument. It's you out there, putting yourself out there for an audience. And that can be very frightening for a lot of people. But something that you need to remember is that while you are a musician and you are a singer, no single day or performance defines you as a person or a musician. I want that to sink in because I wish I would have learned that a lot sooner. You are a musician. You are a singer. No single day or performance defines you as a person or a musician. So if you have an off day, it's okay. You're still a musician. You're still on your journey. You are allowed to make mistakes sometimes. It happens. We're human. Oh, sorry. You wanted to join the camera. Say hi. Oh, come here. Say hi. All right. So this is Oliver. My next tip really just kind of puts a button on the fact that you're a musician. You are a singer, but first and foremost, you're making music. So you need to treat singing as a form of making music. It's not just having sound come out of your mouth. So you really need to work on musicality, phrasing, dynamics, artistic nuance with a piece. It's critically important because yes, you're a singer, but first and foremost, you're a musician. The tips, first one, find a teacher. Two, figure out what works for you, both as part of your warm-up routine, as part of your self-care routine, and figure out if that teacher's working for you. Next point, you need to practice self-care. Get sleep, stay hydrated, stay healthy, because again, you are your instrument. Next tip, you are not defined by any single day or performance. If you mess up one day, it's okay. You're still a musician, and you're still on a journey of growth to being a better musician. And my final point, you're a musician, so you need to treat music as a form of artistic expression. It's not just about having sound come out. I'm gonna recommend a few books. Now, these may be more helpful later on. So some of these books may be better when you're a little older, but I'm just gonna put them here because I highly recommend them, especially when I was teaching privately. This was pretty much standard reading for a lot of my students. So this first one here is The Perfect Wrong Note, Learning to Trust Your Musical Self. This book saved me as a musician. I highly recommend it. Another really good, if older book, for tenors especially, is Training Tenor Voices by Richard Miller. As you can see, it's not currently available new on Amazon, but if you go to a local library, or if you are lucky enough to live close to a university, a music library usually has a copy of this. So it's definitely worth checking out if you're a young tenor. Also, a series of books that I highly, highly, highly recommend 
reading as singers. Again, maybe when you're a little older, are books by Cornelius Reed, who was a very famous uh, vocal pedagogue up in Columbia. <clears throat> and he has a series of books that he wrote. The ones that I have in my personal library are Dictionary of Vocal Terminology and Essays on the Nature of Singing. However, this book right here, there's a reason it comes up first on Amazon. Highly encourage you to check that out. And then also, for general musicianship, this is surprisingly a quick read and a really good guide for how to approach musical expression. In fact, it's just as the title says, it's really understandable. So, especially as you continue your musical journey in becoming a musician, I recommend you check this book out. And I actually have two bonus tips. So the first one, I kind of alluded to a little bit earlier, but singing is a journey. Your voice, your instrument, how you approach it, how you feel about it, what you think you can get out of it is going to change greatly over time. It's about trying to grow and evolve and get better incrementally, step by step. It's easy to get discouraged. It's easy to give up. But just remember that it's not ever really about being perfect. And again, it doesn't define you as a person, but it's about continually growing. So then the other bonus tip I have, something that I constantly have to remind myself, is that you can't take yourself so seriously. Singing needs to come from a place of joy and fun. So while you're trying to figure out what works for you and continuing on this journey and being a good musician and being studious, you have to remember to embrace the fun about it. Right? Makes sense? Cool. All right, well, thanks so much for your time. I hope this helps. Bye. Why should I feel discouraged? Why should the shadows come? Why should my heart be lonely and long for heaven when Jesus is my portion?
excuse my doubt and fear. Go by the path he leadeth, but one step I may see. His as me. His eye is on the sparrow, and I know he watches me. I sing because I'm happy. I sing As you just saw, Ryan's pretty awesome. He's trying to help his community out there by performing in a live streaming church service. Pretty awesome of him to do that. But thanks again for the tips too, Ryan. We appreciated it. Okay, here comes my second word. This one's a doozy. You ready? It's of. O-F. Yep, I'm doing that word again. Of. You know, like carousel of progress. Okay? Of. After all those amazing singers, I gotta tell you, I'm really sorry to tell you that the next singer is, well, me. That's my voice part. I'm, I'm a bass and I sing professionally, so I figured it would be a good idea, since these are music basics with Ballard, that I tell you about singing bass. So I'm going to do my best. Here we go. The first tip I have for singing bass well is really understanding the vocal cavity or the space in which you are singing. Basses often have to resonate pitches that aren't going to carry as far as the higher notes do. And oftentimes, basses need to make sure that they really have a good, wide opening cavity. Uh, if you remember in Breathing Basics, I talked about that woe-shaped breath. You really want to think through that woe shape in order to get that nice, big, round sound. You notice how my voice has changed because I have moved the opening and made sure that it is nice and round and woe shaped. So I, my voice very clearly changes when I speak that way. Now, I know, I don't normally talk that way. No one really does. But when you are singing, oh, that note sounds so much better than, oh, yeah, they're the same pitch, but oh, with that big open shape will definitely help you out. So there's tip number one. Tip number two for singing basses. One thing that basses have to do a lot is jump around. Basses are often moving through weird interval changes. And so really knowing your intervals and not just being able to sing melodic intervals, but being able to understand that when you're singing, especially when singing in choir or in an opera company, that the bass part is going to jump all over the place and really understanding the distance between one note to another and hearing them in your head while you're singing them is really, really big and important. So my second tip is understand your intervals. Know that you're not always going to be singing melody lines, especially as a bass. So understand that as a bass, you need to know the distance between your notes up and down, okay? That interval exercise that I do really would help. You know, the minor second, major second, you know, we talked about that one in a previous video. So you wanna check that out, go ahead and look at it, all right? So know your intervals. Okay, my next tip for singing bass well is understanding that basses don't just sing low. Some basses have to sing up a little bit higher. Um, yeah, 
sitting in a song that sits in the higher part of your voice for a long time, that can be tiring. I understand what that means. But understand that basses aren't always going to sing down in the basement. They're always not going to be able to get their lowest notes and be like, bah, and just sit down there all the time. That's not the way it's going to work. You need to understand that as a bass, you're going to end up singing some notes that are up higher. So be prepared and practice those upper notes. During the warm-ups, don't just give up and stop when you're like, oh, it's starting to get too high. Don't be whiny. Just do it. Trust me, having the higher notes makes you a better rounded bass, okay? One of the really important parts about being a bass is knowing your limits. I know that sounds like a weird thing to say, but the human voice is given to you through your genetics and your voice is not going to go any deeper. You can't always make your voice go lower and you can't always make your voice go higher. Some people are blessed with a really big range and some people are not. And it's okay. One of the things you understand as a bass is that if you don't have some of those lower notes, it's all right. Just let it happen and understand that those notes aren't yours and that song probably isn't for you. And knowing when to say, hey, I don't have those notes down there is a really good tip to have as a bass. You, not everyone can hit them and it's okay. The final tip I'm gonna give you is that, especially because you're often in the lower register of your voice when you're singing in bass, you really need to enunciate. And you really need to make sure all those consonants are really, really clear and not getting in the way of your singing. Because if you're trying to sing like, I'm just gonna sing a little bit of America the Beautiful. Oh, beautiful for spacious skies, for amber waves of grain. Now, if even if I sing with the best quality I can of my voice and don't enunciate, especially in those lower tones, it's just gonna, the words are gonna vanish. Listen, I'll try, I, I, I'm gonna try here to not enunciate. Oh, beautiful for spacious skies, for amber waves of grain. I'll try singing a little lower for you, can see what I'm talking about. Oh, beautiful for spacious skies, for amber waves of grain. For purple mountain majesty above the fruited plain. Now, you see what I mean? If I wasn't enunciating down there, you would start losing the word. So really understand that as a base, you really have to concentrate on enunciation, okay? And that's my last tip. The trumpet shall sound, and the dead shall be raised, and the dead shall be raised incorruptible. The trumpet shall sound, and the dead shall be raised, be raised incorruptible, be raised incorruptible, and we shall be changed, and we shall be changed. The trumpet shall sound, the trumpet shall sound, and the dead shall be raised, be raised incorruptible, be raised incorruptible. And we shall be changed, be changed, and we shall be changed, and we shall be changed, we shall be changed, we shall be changed. 
and we shall be changed. And we shall be changed. We shall be changed. And we shall be changed. We shall be changed. Hey, I hope you were able to hear me doing all of my tips throughout that performance. Uh, thanks a lot for listening. I'm going to move on to our final performer today, and that is Susan Geyer. She plays the piano. Wait. Piano? That's not a voice part. Actually, it's extremely important. A lot of singers use their piano skills while they're learning parts, and being able to play the piano and sing is actually something that really goes together. So I threw in the piano here because having a pianist talk to you about exactly what the skills are you need to get better at it will help you be a better singer. So let's listen to what Susan has to say. <sighs> Where are my manners? I'm so sorry, I forgot to introduce you to Susan. Susan Geyer has been a music director for over 20 years and teaches voice and piano. She studied vocal performance with a minor in piano at Westchester University and has two professionally recorded albums. She performs and has also been music director, vocal arranger, rehearsal performance accompanist, and choreographer in the Philadelphia area with public and private theaters, including Bravo Theater Company, The Media Theater, Gilbert and Sullivan Society of Chester County, PCS, Rose Valley Chorus and Orchestra, Footlighters, Center Stage Productions, and Hedgerow Theater. Susan's performances include appearances at Carnegie Hall, Philly's WOGL 98.1, The CW 57, Channel 69 News, The Rachel Ray Show, and she has sung internationally by opening for Olivia Newton-John. So not only is she a talented piano player, She's a talented singer, too. So let's listen to what Susan has to say about playing the piano. Hi, everyone. I'm here to talk about a couple of tips for your, you beginner play, piano players out there. And this doesn't mean that it doesn't apply to advanced piano players, but in particular, a couple of things to note so that you will be a success as you learn piano. One of the things that the first thing that I'd like to talk about is taking it slowly. Um, pay attention to what fingering you're using and learn it correctly the first time so you don't learn how to play multiple ways. So definitely try to do it as accurately as possible the first time, but take it slow. There's an impromptu by Schubert that I learned when I was pretty young and one of the pieces, one of the things was finger, ac finger accuracy and speed because it's a very, very fast piece um, in this certain section. Super quick, but I didn't learn it that quick the, for the first time. It took me months in order to play it at that speed. So really take your time. time take it very very slowly I didn't automatically play it at that speed but you can work up generally to make it faster and then do it again a little bit faster and you will gradually work your way up to the speed that you needed to be so make sure to take it slow if you even if you think it's at the right speed take it slow <laughs> uh, accuracy not speed uh, the second thing is when you're learning how to play a piece, um, you should always learn hands separately first, one hand at a time, because your brain has a really hard time processing new information with both hands independently. So you want to get your right hand so that it is totally 110% comfortable with what you're playing, as well as the left hand independently totally comfortable. So then when you add them together, it's going you're going to have a much easier time. Always one hand at a time, then put the two together. Now, a lot of songs, whether it's a classical piece or it's a 
pop song, um, they're going to have different sections um, and even sections within sections. So you have your main melody and then it may go off on somewhere else and then the main melody comes back in again. Definitely work in sections. Don't try to tackle a whole piece by itself. Break it into sections. And even if you're struggling with a few measures, take out those few measures. Don't always start from the beginning every single time. Take out the couple of measures that you need to work on and then put it back together. So sometimes there's chunky chords and I kind of have a hard time seeing if there's lots of accidentals and things like that, reading them. struggle. If it's a lot of notes, pull it out, put it back into the section. Um, then the next thing is sometimes, especially if we're having, uh, working on a, a, a section that's extremely difficult, we can get extremely frustrated um, and want to give up on the piece entirely. When you find that you are frustrated um, or your back hurts or you're thirsty, definitely don't be afraid to take a break. It's very important that you take breaks. Frustration will happen if you want to take breaks in between different songs, you can do that. Um, even if you are frustrated with one piece and you move on to the other piece, another piece and go back to the original piece later, make sure to take a break. It's gonna give your brain a rest and it will make the process a lot better and a lot easier for you. Then the very last thing I wanna say is to make sure to start and end with a piece that you like to play, that you play well, um, because it will give you an incentive to keep going. So start and end with a piece that you really love. Even if the ones in the middle you're not really fond of because you kind of have to learn them for some reason, they're valuable to learn for some reason, but always start and end with a piece that you love. I hope that these tips are helpful and good luck in your piano playing.
Thanks, Susan. Well, there you have it. Four singers and a piano player telling you how to get better at being a better singer. You notice how important that piano playing would be to your singing? That's why it's in here. And hopefully our soprano, our alto, our tenor, and myself were able to help you get a little bit better tips on how to sing well too. So thanks again for watching. Before I go here, I wanna tell you that my final word is presidents, as in George Washington was one of our first presidents. And it's a great word, so presidents. All right, there you have it. Basic singing tips. Hopefully my video has been helpful to you. If you liked it, please think about subscribing to the channel or hitting the like button. And if you really want to see new videos when they come out, as you notice, I put out a lot of them, hit the bell icon to be notified when that happens. All right, until then, see you bye. Hey Victor, did you have fun being on the video today? I'll take that as a no.